Hello. Here is my Amstrad PC-1640, which is an IBM PC XT clone from the mid-1980s. This computer and its predecessor, the PC-1512, were instrumental in introducing Europe to the PC platform, mainly because of their ridiculously low price compared to IBM's PCs. I won't go into too much detail because Nostalgia Nerd and Retro Man Cave have both covered this PC admirably well in their videos, which I'll link to below. This particular model is the PC 1640 SD, which has a single floppy drive and no hard drive, and comes with a PC MM monitor, which is a monochrome model that's actually really nice and sharp compared to the IBM monitors. This is the exact model of PC my dad had when I was a child, and he never let me use it. But now I'm 35, so I bought my own, and there's nothing dad can do to stop me from fiddling with it. I can't be bothered messing about with real floppies though, so I've already replaced the built-in floppy drive with a GoTech USB floppy emulator, for which I needed to rather crudely crimp on the standard 34-pin IDC connector. This lets me boot into MS-DOS and run simple applications and stuff, but I really want to be able to install larger programs, so I thought I'd investigate installing a hard drive. The PC actually came with a hard drive, but its motor is long since seized up, so that isn't really an option. Finding a contemporary hard drive and compatible controller card would be one option, but I thought I'd investigate more modern solutions. The XT IDE project seems ideal for my requirements, as it connects to a standard 8-bit ISA slot and allows you to plug in basically any IDE hard drive, or even a compact flash card. Unfortunately, the official XT IDE Tindy page was sold out, as were all the other sites selling them at the time. There were a few available on eBay, but they were all quite expensive. However, I found this one guy in Russia selling optimized versions of the XT IDE in kit form for only £18, which even has some additional features like a built-in compact flash slot. So I bought one and here it is. Let's build it and see if it works. Now, the first thing I noticed was the very non-ESD-safe packaging of these ICs. They were just jammed in some foam and wrapped with cling film. They're TTL ICs, so they're not all that sensitive to electrostatic discharge compared to CMOS ICs, but it's still slightly off-putting. Another thing I noticed was the complete lack of bypass capacitors on any of the IC's power pins. The schematic even has a somewhat dismissive note explaining why. Again, this is all fairly low frequency stuff, so they might not technically be necessary, but it's generally considered good practice. If I have trouble later, I'll maybe add some. The final little potential problem I noticed was on the card edge. The contacts are covered in solder rather than being gold plated, and there's no beveling on the insertion edge. This has the potential to damage the ISA slots in the PC if it's repeatedly inserted and removed, but hopefully it'll work first time and I'll never have to remove it. <laughs> anyway, let's start building the board. There are no instructions with the board at all, so hopefully it'll be pretty much self-explanatory. I'm going to start by fitting an IC socket in position U10, which is where the BIOS ROM goes. This is so I can swap it in and out as much as I like without resoldering. The kit doesn't come with an IC socket, and the ones I have in the workshop are too big, so I just snipped one down to size and soldered it in. Next come all the logic ICs, which I won't bother installing sockets for. The board is extremely clearly labelled, so populating the ICs was easy and took no time at all, and I taped them all down to keep them in place. Soldering was similarly easy, although I could only find a fine tip for my soldering iron, so heating up the pads was a bit of an arse. Next up is the dip switches, which are used to set various configuration options on the board. Now finally the compact flash connector, which was a little bit harder than the other solder joints. Normally I'm okay with fine pitch work, but ironically using a fine tip on the soldering iron made it much harder than my preferred wide flat tip. Anyway, I got it in the end. That was everything soldered in, or so I thought. I programmed the XT IDE BIOS into the included EEPROM using my TL866 ROM programmer. You can actually program the ROM directly on the board from your PC using a special program, but to me this was way quicker because I had the ROM programmer handy anyway. Next, it was just a case of installing the ROM in the socket and I could test the card in the PC. I didn't try connecting a hard drive at this stage, I just wanted to make sure the BIOS came up okay. Unfortunately, it did not. It turned out I had to first configure the ROM using the DOS-based software, which I ran on my Windows 10 PC using DOSBox. Even if you don't change any settings, you still have to configure the ROM so it writes the checksum. With the checksummed ROM programmed, it finally booted the XT IDE BIOS. However, I couldn't get it to detect the compact flash card in the socket, or even a regular hard drive using the IDE connector at the back. So after consulting the schematic I found on GitHub, it turns out a lot of components were missing from this kit, including a number of resistors and a capacitor. I installed these myself from my own stock, and although I didn't have exact replacements for these resistor arrays, I was able to snip one down to size. It wasn't quite the same resistance value, but as it's only a logic pull-up, it won't make a difference. With these components installed, the compact flash socket still didn't work, but the IDE connector attached to a regular IDE hard drive finally detected something. Worryingly, I was getting corrupted names in the BIOS screen, and when trying to format the hard drive, I just got a bunch of error messages. My suspicions immediately fell upon the bypass capacitors, or lack thereof. I decided to install 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitors across the power rails of every IC on the board. Unfortunately, that didn't help either. What fixed it in the end was reflowing every joint on the compact flash connector. I guess there must have been a short or something. That still didn't get the compact flash slot working, but at least the IDE connector did now. I ordered some IDE to compact flash adapters in the meantime. 
The version of MS-DOS that comes with the PC-1640, namely MS-DOS 3.2, just has no idea whatsoever how to deal with the 40GB hard drive I'm using. I suspect this is because it has several hundred heads per cylinder rather than the dozen or so hard drives from the time came with and it's just overflowing some value. Anyway, I just put MS-DOS 5.0 installed disk onto my USB floppy emulator and installed that version instead. This worked like a charm and booted up into the standard DOS shell. From there I was able to install a test program, namely Monkey Island, which despite being intended for EGA PCs has a Hercules compatible graphics mode, which is what this computer has. The intro music sounds fantastic through the Amstrad's built-in speaker, which even has a volume control unlike every other PC speaker I've ever seen. The game is more or less playable, although scrolling is painfully slow. Anyway, that's it for part one of my Amstrad PC adventure, join me next time when we'll look at installing some graphical user interfaces on this thing, including the gem environment that came bundled with it, and maybe even Windows. So subscribe and hit the notification button if you're interested in seeing that. Goodbye.